following program is brought to you by the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets at University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business. Welcome to the Ink Tank. Stay with us to get the inside scoop about technologies that could disrupt and challenge the way you do business. Hello, I'm Christina Elson, and on this edition of the Ink Tank, we'll discuss the future of biotechnology and the startup industry. We're likely to see impressive biotech innovations in the next decade. How will policy keep up with the scale of discovery? Our guest today, Robbie Barbero, is the Chief Business Officer at Ceres Nanosciences. Prior to joining Ceres, Robbie was the Assistant Director of Biological Innovation in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Robbie, it's great to have you here with me today in the Ink Tank. Thanks so much for taking the time to come and talk to us about uh, biotech. So. There's a couple areas that I wanted to um, talk with you about today because of your expertise, both working in policy, but also, you know, being deeply involved in a startup company. So though there's sort of three things. One is helping us understand, like, what biotech is and how fast it's growing and what we can expect in the next 10 to 15 years. You know, another area is like, what is this regulatory landscape uh, that that biotech companies are dealing with, and how is that helping innovation, or what are the challenges to innovation? And then third, really, like, what is your experience as someone who is, you know, running this really interesting um, company, which we'll talk a lot about in a bit. So, so let's just jump into the first one. So. Give me how how do you define biotech? Because uh, it's you know it it's this is one of the scariest things that we talk about in the ink tank is biotech. You know, space is not that scary, but biotech is really scary. So how do you define it, and what are some of the fears or concerns you know that you get from people when you talk to to them about biotech? Yeah, <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks for having me, and I would just say. I don't think biotech is at all scary. Mm-hmm. It's exciting. And um, and that is why I'm in it. Um, I think a lot of the fears or concerns that people have about biotech is that it's a it's a big, complicated area. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit harder to understand than some other areas. And frankly, it's one of the only um, areas of science or, or in, in industry where we're making products that are alive or came from something that's alive. Yeah, great. <clears throat> so for me, biotech is uh, the use of biology to make products, okay? So maybe we're manipulating biology. Maybe we're just um, taking something, like something that we grow, and then we're turning it into a product like food, all right? Um, that's a, it's a pretty big space. It can c- include things like medical devices where you're going in and putting something into a person in order to sort of help their body be healthier or fix some problem with their body. It can go all the way through agriculture and um, chemicals that help treat pests, uh, and obviously drugs are a big part of it as well. So uh, digging a little deeper into this definition of biotech, what are some things that you see in the next, say, 10 to 15 years that we can look forward to, uh, you know, exciting, not scary, exciting, (laughs) that we can see um, and look forward to in biotech? Well, to answer that question, I I think it's good to look back and kind of uh, remember where we are in the history of biotech. So biotech really is only 70 years old. The discovery of DNA, the structure of DNA, goes back to the the middle of the 20th century. Uh, It took us another 20 years or so, 25 years, to figure out how to manipulate DNA. And then really biotech took off at that point. Um, So we're just at the 25, 30 year point of the start of this industry, it's already a um, you know, well over a hundred billion dollar industry. Um, we're in a really interesting time right now because there have been so many new discoveries as far as ways to manipulate biology and understand biology. And you add on top of that the ability to take the information about biology and put it into our very powerful computers and do a lot of interesting um, analyses on these on these data. Um, so I think that what we're gonna see in the next decade is uh, just an increasing number of new products coming across the whole spectrum. So cr- crops, foods, 
um, organisms that are going to be making things like chemicals for us that we used to get from oil that we do you know still get from oil but we're going to be able to make them from biology uh, from sunlight and carbon uh, and I think a lot of stuff in the therapeutic space one of the most exciting things is uh, everything that we're doing around immunotherapy. So unless you've been living under a rock, you know now that you can take immune cells from people and grow them up and sort of engineer them to go back and kill cancers. Uh, we also now have drugs that we can give people to go in and very specifically target cancers by activating the immune system. Uh, we're going to see a lot more stuff along those areas. Um, I will just throw one out there because it's, it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that when I mention it to people, they say, Wow, is that really possible? So there, there is uh, real money and real science going into the space of being able to fight the process of aging, not just the symptoms of aging. Wow. Um, and there, and it goes under this bucket of improving, increasing our health span or our or our lifespan. So it, I don't mean we're going to live for a thousand years, although some people think that might be possible. Um, <laughs> but it's more like. Why do we have to go through this long, slow decline at the end of our life? Sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 15 or 20 years where we're accumulating these symptoms of aging. Um, there's now a real possibility that in the next 20 years or so, you can live a full, healthy life right up until the very end. That, that's really fascinating. I mean, you do, you know, see that uh, there's a lot of chron you know, chronic pain associated with, you know, I, I noticed, I mean, the, the doctor told me the other day, I can't wear hot three inch heels anymore. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I pulled my calf running yesterday. <laughs> right? So <That's laughs> the last time that happened to me. Right? It's like, hello. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I would love it <laughs> if we could fix the, fix a lot of things. But yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot associated with aging that, um, you know, slows down people's desire to be productive. It slows down their ability to engage with their family, you know, and be part of the community. Um, so we'd like to more fully embrace older people as part of a, a productive society. And that's a really Yeah, and we spend 60 years working. Why shouldn't we really get to enjoy those last 20 years? That's right. Um, I mean, it, it, this is so getting back to your question about scary, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to yeah. use the word scary, but I think mm -hmm. uh, now you have to run the thought exercise on what would it mean if you could live until you were 90 years old and still be fully productive and do everything that a 40 or 50 year old could do. What does that mean for society? Yeah. What does it mean for the entitlement programs that we have? What does it mean for keeping people employed? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for productivity? What does it mean for the use of resources? Mm -hmm. A lot of interesting questions at a societal and global level that um, very few people are thinking about, right? So if we build these things, which we're building them. People are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into these areas. Mm -hmm. um, what are the implications for society down the road? I mean, that's the as a former policy person, those are the kind of questions that are interesting when you think about the intersection of of science, technology, and policy. Yeah, it really is, and it's something that we want to, you know, being in higher education, we really want to encourage, you know, students uh, going into any of these areas to think about as we have these converging technologies. But let's talk about your policy experience because you spent. Um, you know, quite a bit of time in the Obama administration and a really interesting time and, uh, you know, spearheading some interesting work on trying to think through how the regulatory structures that we have uh, involving biotech could um, work well with all the changes um, in that area. So tell us a little bit about what that was like. What was a recognition and what were some of the um, issues that you were thinking to address trying to maintain this balance between, you know, encouraging innovation and free trade, but also trying to make sure that we're preparing for the right. Yeah. So, so that um, let me tell you a little bit about what my role was in the mm -hmm. White House, and then you can understand why I took the approach that I did and one, why this was one of the areas that I worked on. So I arrived um, in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is one of about a dozen policy councils in the White House, uh, which is run by the president's science advisor. I arrived there in September of 2012, just coming straight out of my PhD from MIT. Um, and this was before CRISPR had even been widely you know, published or discussed. Uh -huh. um, but there were a lot of interesting things happening, kind of much easier to synthesize DNA, to sequence DNA, even to genetically engineer with other other approaches. 
And they brought me in and said, you know, biotechnology and life sciences are going to be a portfolio that you're going to cover. There were other life scientists, life scientists in the office, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a big space. So you need, you know, need people who have expertise across uh, kind of overlapping pieces of expertise. Right. And um, I started just talking to all, as many smart, thoughtful people as I could saying, what are the things that aren't happening that should be happening? Where are areas where uh, we need the White House to spend a little time thinking about trying to tune up the system or improve the system or fix it or build new stuff. And mm -hmm. um, it w became pretty clear that uh, our federal regulatory system for ensuring the safety of biotech products was going to need a tune-up. It was created in the 1980s by the Reagan administration when genetic engineering first became possible. Mm -hmm. And it was tuned up by the first Bush administration, but it hadn't been touched since then. And a lot of things changed sure. in biology. Between <laughs> 1992 yeah. and 2012, um, the Clinton administration briefly tried to do something on it, but they just they started too late and then uh -huh. had to leave before they got anything done. Um, and so I started looking at it, and I just I took a classic engineer's approach, which is let's assess the landscape, let's look at what the future might hold for us, and then mm -hmm. let's see how well those two match up against each other. And if they don't, then let's figure out some things to do. Um, one of the interesting things about the White House is that you don't actually have that much ability to make things happen. You can say a lot of things, sure. you can you can nudge a lot of people, you can make a lot of noise, but- <laughs> Make a lot of tweets. You can, <laughs> right. yeah, as I, I mean, the current occupant, I think, is learning this, <laughs> right. that it's really about influencing people, sure. not about just saying, go do it. Uh -huh. um, and so that was what I had to figure out how to do, find mm -hmm. out who the people in the government are that, uh, that actually regulate biotech products mm -hmm. and get them to understand the way that I was thinking about this. Uh, and it was pretty, many of them already agreed. They were just waiting for someone to say, yeah, let's go do this. Um, yeah. yeah. So there are three, there are three agencies that are responsible for regulating biotech products, the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to bring all of them together and say, 25 years ago, you guys agreed to do these things. Um, some of those approaches don't seem to be working anymore or have changed without you clearly articulating that they've changed. And it's just good government if we go out and re, uh, uh, retell everyone how we're doing what we're doing and then ask for feedback from the experts on what changes we can make. So that's basically what we did. I and mean, we didn't do anything we didn't create any new parts of government. Mm -hmm. We didn't write new laws. Mm -hmm. We just said, here's how the system is actually wrote down on a piece of paper for the first time in 25 years. Here's how the system is currently functioning. And then we put in place a strategy for them to keep doing that sort of assessment and making improvements on it over the next five years. So that's important because, you know, creating the transparency for how something could move through a system who who's going to look at it and you know as you're saying just laying out the process also can help you identify if there's any gaps or right. areas that you know maybe no one's paying yeah. attention to so is that something that that happened i mean i i guess one of the area in this uh, it, there's so much going on in in these spaces where some of what's happening is even outside, you know, so you have high school science classes and, you know, biotech hackers and like who's regulating them, you know, so nobody, maybe, I don't know. But I mean, were there areas that you just thought, oh, wow, you know, we need to put some eyes on that or. Yeah, yeah. so I, there's very little that is actual in this country. Uh -huh. It is actually very hard to freelance and do things that are really dangerous to the broad the broader public. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, I mean, <laughs> yeah. we hear a lot. I, the do-it-yourself biology community yeah. um, is actually doing a really nice job of interacting with the appropriate authorities, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, and they know how to call and how to be in touch with that and and teaching their, uh, their constituents, mm -hmm. right, the people who show up there, here's the appropriate and safe way to do the things that you want to do. Okay. It's also important to remember that we don't live inside of an authoritarian system. So our government doesn't monitor everything that we do every day, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> and keep, the, and that's and so that's that's an important yeah. principle, right? We we, right. we create these rules, we create these frameworks, and we trust our citizens right. to do the appropriate thing. Um, mm -hmm. And with that framework in mind, 
what I thought was the most important thing to do was just to write down on a piece of paper, if you're working on this type of product, here's the agency you need to go talk to. And we did that. So mm-hmm. we just, we wrote it down. It was that simple, super boring, you know, <laughs> super boring, but it was that, it was that simple to just write it down. If you have this kind of product, here is you, who you need to go talk to. And that's the way that our regulatory system is really supposed to work. If you're building something that you're going to try to commercialize, go talk to the government and say, what things do I need to do? And those agencies and the people who work there, many of whom have been there since the system was created, will tell you what, what approach you need to take. So bi- biotech is a very difficult area to operate a startup. I mean, it, you know, talent is expensive, equipment is expensive, time frames are long. So share a little bit about what you see as a, you know, in this space running, running this business. And then let's talk a little bit about what you're doing in there. Okay, yeah. great. Mm-hmm. So the most important thing in this industry is doing good science. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to have good science. You have to have good data because that's what everybody cares about. You need to prove to your customers and to the regulators and to your partners mm-hmm. that you, the things that you say you're doing, you're actually doing. That's actually something that I find really refreshing. There are a lot of a lot of places in this world where um, you can get away without data and facts for a long time. Or a product. <laughs> or a product. Right, right, right. But in our industry that separates the 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 success the successful companies from the from the non successful companies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you build out from there, mm-hmm. right? So how do I find the people who not just know the science but know how to think about it and understand it and understand why we are doing that science. How do you, and then you decide what equipment you need and what facilities you need and what partners you need to get there. Um, It is a longer horizon than a lot of other industries, Mm -hmm. um, but that's because it takes a long time to assemble the right data sets and the right evidence and proof that you're doing the things that you want to do. The good news is it means that it's going to be almost as hard for anybody else to do that as well. Mm -hmm. So... um, I like being in an industry where if I go to sleep at night, I'm not worried that somebody's going to catch up with me overnight, mm-hmm. right? There are definitely industries where that's true, sure. right? If you take a week off right. in some industries, a new company can form, take over half your market, right. do the exact same thing you're doing, and now you're a head-to-head competition. Right. In my industry, uh, you do need to run fast. You mm-hmm. need to make sure you're not making mistakes. But you can build off of your progress and you can really build a substantial lead that you know makes you valuable uh, just based on the work that you've done. So tell, tell us a little bit about Series Nanosciences. What, is, what are you doing there? Um, what is the goal? We make uh, a product, it's chemistry basically, mm-hmm. that can improve the performance of diagnostic tests. Okay, so we have a little particle that can capture, concentrate, Preserve very low abundance analytes, and by analytes I mean anything, right? It can be okay. uh, chemicals, it can be proteins, it can be whole virus particles, uh-huh. uh, it can be DNA. Take that out of a real biological sample, so blood or urine or saliva, and um, and then put it into an assay downstream or a test downstream. So we don't make any of those tests. We mm-hmm. just we are just in the business of improving the acquisition of the data from your body, okay? And the, and this is a this is an important area to be in because mm-hmm. as we move into an era of personalized medicine or precision medicine, um, the quality of the data about you, about your states of health and disease, is the most important thing for your physicians, for you, for everybody to understand what kind of things we should be doing to help you. Um, if you don't have good data sets, just like in anything, garbage in, garbage out is true in biology, just like it is in, in software. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't have those good data sets, you can't make the right decisions. And we, we, just, we realize that being able to turn those, um, you know, those atoms, those things that are floating around in your body uh-huh. into the digital information was, was really important. And that very few people were thinking about how am I going to get that data out of the body and into the machine that's going to convert it. So that's that's where we focus is on that that upfront from the machine piece of it. Yeah, that's cool. That's like the point that 
converting atoms to bits as like that's cool like you're actually the person that's doing that well, <laughs> so yeah and we don't actually make the machines that convert it right we just help you get, get the it. atoms you're into the, the interface machine. right yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's We're cool the, yeah that's yeah. right <laughs> so so once it gets into the machine, we were talking a little bit about, again, the quality of data sets and the power now, the computing power that's available for some of this. So what are some of the challenges that you all have in terms of get getting the samples that you want to really hone the product that you're doing? I mean. Well, this gets back to your previous question about uh-huh. cost. Yep. Getting real biological samples mm-hmm. is expensive, mm-hmm. right? Because you're you're asking someone for what is essentially or just recently was a piece of their body. And, and there are a lot of rules around the appropriate way to do that um, to make sure that people understand what you're going to do with that sample that they gave you, especially in product development. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a whole set of rules and you have to spend a lot of time making sure for good reason that you're not taking this information from people and doing something inappropriate with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's time and cost involved there. On top of that, you have to make sure that, again, going back to doing good science, that the question you're trying to answer about the biology can actually be answered by that sample. Uh And that's a hard one to know um, when you're, so there's a little bit of catch 22 here, right? If you're trying to develop a new test for a disease, Mm -hmm. right? That doesn't have a test for it. Here's the thought exercise for you. If it's not already easily diagnosable, how do you find people who have it who can give you samples so that you can build the test? Yeah, yeah, right. Because some, <laughs> some of these things really haven't even been defined yet as a disease, right? right. So there's a spec- it's like a spectrum and there's all this stuff and we're trying right. to sort it out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you have to, so you have to, if 10% of the people Mm-hmm. who are suspected of having the disease, actually have it. Mm-hmm. And you need to assemble a data set of 300 tu- true positives uh-huh. in order to prove that your test works. That means you have to ask 3,000 people for their sample. Yeah, right. And their yeah. doctor. Yeah. And then you have to store it and transport it and do all that stuff. So it's a, it's a complicated, challenging process. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I can see that's where a lot of time and money and effort and just trying to work through that process. Um, So let's talk a little bit about what kind of funding um, is available to support this kind of um, work, because there's a lot of uh, news about, you know, big, big biotech companies, you know, genetic companies. determinations or, you know, whatever people are doing and lots of venture capital going in there and big rates. So um, what what about in some of these, and then there's drugs, right? The yep. emerging drugs. So, but there's a lot of other people that are doing things like what, you know, Series Nano Sciences is doing. So what is the venture capital landscape look like in that area? Or We, we sit in the diagnostics area, mm-hmm. which is... Um, Really having a reemergence in the last few years. So I'll give you a, a, just a single data point. There's a company called Grail. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but they have raised over one billion dollars in funding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their vision is like they're going to be able to diagnose every disease. Uh-huh. They're assembling a massive, massive set of real samples uh-huh. from people and looking, and then. In order to be able to try to diagnose every or many diseases, you have to collect lots and lots of samples so Uh that you have statistically significant numbers at each time. So Mm -hmm. that tells you that there is, you know, there is money in this space. And we've had, you know, we have a very clear value proposition. We have Mm -hmm. a really powerful technology. um, And we've gotten a lot of receptivity from investors when we've gone out and, and asked for money. We also don't because we don't build the machines, mm-hmm. we don't build the boxes, um, and our product is chemi- uh, chemistry, right. uh, we have a much lower, uh, we're less capital intensive than a lot of other um, products and technologies in this space. Um, so it, it it's a great space to be in right now. Biotech broadly is doing great. It keeps breaking records every year for 
IPOs yeah. and for acquisitions. And diagnostics are increasingly becoming important because as we, again, move into an era of precision medicine, mm -hmm. the drug companies want to know that the drugs that they're developing are going to the right people. Mm -hmm. So the days of just like, take an aspirin and your headache will go away. That'll always be true, right? But as we get into more sophisticated therapies, we want to make sure that we're giving the therapies to the people who are most likely to respond to them. And the way that you do that is through more accurate diagnostics. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you need that continuous feedback, right? And uh, and so let's talk a little bit about um, the employment landscape going forward. So, you know, you uh, went to MIT. I mean, I'm sure that wasn't like a cakewalk PhD kind of situation. So. It's an intense place. It's a very <laughs> right. intense place. I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, and then you went into, uh, po into doing some policy for a while. And, you know, now you're in the business community. Um, so what what was that path like? And what, what advice could you give to other students, you know, undergraduate students who are sort of looking at how, where can I plug into biotech? I mean, you know, some of them who are doing degrees, um, you know, in, in, in engineering type field, but there, you know, there's other people out there that are just fascinated by all, all of this um, growth and innovation in the, in this area. So what, what advice do you have? So, so mm -hmm. we didn't even touch on this yet, but I mm -hmm. actually took five years off between undergraduate and graduate school. Okay. So my first three jobs mm -hmm. straight out of undergraduate were in small biotech companies. Oh, cool. Okay. And it was a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people um, small companies are great if you're for young people especially mm -hmm. because if you are a hard worker and you uh, are good at your job, you can get much more experience and responsibility in a small company than you can in a large company. Yeah. Because let's be honest, small companies don't have enough people to do the things they want, all the things they want to do, right? Sure. <laughs> so if you're if you're excelling uh -huh. uh, in your role in a small company, you will definitely get more responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my piece of advice is, uh, especially if you're young, go out and find that small company. It's a little bit harder because those companies don't have the resources to come to your career fair and really pursue you the way that a larger company would. Mm -hmm. um, but you can go find those companies, and there are a variety of paths to doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you find them, and you can convince, you know, some, you, you have to find one that's looking for, for people. But when you find them and you can get in and get do that job, take the job. So my first job was as a quality control associate, which is the least sexy role in biotechnology. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> Right. Make sure that the thing that we just built works the way that we said it's going to work. <laughs> right. And then do it again tomorrow and the and next day the next and the next day, day and the next day. Right. But um, I learned a lot about the way that the business runs because the product is the most important thing in biotech sure. just anywhere, right? Sure. Everyone thinks R&D is the sexy thing, but mm -hmm. R&D is just trying to figure out what new product to make. Mm -hmm. The product that you're making and guaranteeing that it's the same every time is the core. It's the meat of the business. Mm -hmm. And so going in as a 22-year-old and doing quality control and seeing this is how we prove that this thing works the same every time. And yeah. here's what we do when it doesn't work. And here is, you know, that gave me a lot of visibility. I got to know the management team really quickly because I was the only quality control person. Sure. Yeah. And you could help them understand. Like, yeah. Help them they, understand. Yeah. And then I, they added more and more responsibility uh -huh. um, as I learned how to do that job better. So, you know, go find that small company, take that first job, even if you don't think it's the most exciting and sexy one, because trust me, if the company is on a growth path, which most of these companies are, if they're not, they'll shut down. You can find a new one. Right <laughs> right. After that. If they're on that growth path, you will have the opportunity to do more interesting <laughs> things moving forward. Yeah. So there's a there's a pretty decent abundance of biotech startups in this Washington, D.C. Um, area. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities for y young people around Definitely. here, would you say? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and, for sure. Yeah. And I, I love that point about, you know, like it, it really is a two-way street. I mean, when you are coming out of out of college and you, you want to find that first job, it should be about ma matching, you know, your goals and values with those of the company and, and making sure that there's something there for both of you and not just that, well, they showed up on campus and 
And know. I recognize the name, the <laughs> brand, I recognize right? the brand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really do encourage as much as I can students to dig below the, the brand, right? Dig below the brand. So, um, so that's great. So there's a lot of opportunity in this area. Um, what would you like to see happen in the next 10 to 15 years in terms of um, emerging uh, science in biotech? Like what would be to you like a, a great thing um, for for this field? So I'm just going to I'm going to be really broad here yeah. because I'm going to tell you what gets me excited about biotech. Um uh-huh every day and has been since I first started studying it in, in college, uh, the ability to reliably predict how a living system will respond to some sort of manipulation, that's the dream. I mean, that's what we really want. Mm-hmm. Um, we can do that for the most part with software, right? We can write a piece of code and then if we test it enough and get the bugs out, we know if you do this, it will give you this answer. If you do this, it'll give you this answer. Um, the machine learning AI piece is a little different because we don't actually know how those things are making the decision that they are kind of teaching themselves, right? Sure. But in a lot of in in a lot of fields of engineering, mm-hmm. we know what will happen to the system when we manipulate it. Mm-hmm. We don't. We're not at that point with biology, mm-hmm. um, and especially not at the level of complex biological systems like organisms or even tissues. So that's the dream, you know. I want to be it would be amazing to just sit down and say if I change this protein here are all the things that will at the level of the organism that will happen. Yeah. Um, I mean I think that's great. Uh I will put out I will put one kind of marker down as something a little more tangible and and interesting that I think um I think that it would be amazing in the next 10 years if we could grow a human kidney. Yeah. In a, you know, in a lab because there are 90,000 people on the organ transplant waiting list Mm -hmm. waiting for kidneys. Mm -hmm. There are not enough people donating them. And most of these people have, you know, five to 10 year maximum uh, lifespans when you're when you're on that on that waiting list. Um, It should be possible. Yeah. To solve that problem. In the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Not five, but, but I think ten. in 10 years. There are, there are companies working on growing yeah. organs. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's yeah. A, there's it's actually in not just small companies, but big companies, including United Therapeutics, which is just right here in our in our neighborhood. Um, they're starting with lungs, but that's that's what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So great. I mean, obviously a lot to look forward to. And uh, well, Robbie, thanks so much for coming in and helping clear up some of this landscape and and sharing with us some of the information about what's exciting in biotech and, you know, what Ceres Nanosciences is doing. I I really appreciate the time and uh, I look forward to having you come back and giving us an update maybe i'll come back anytime sounds good (laughs) thanks for having me and i'll just put in one more plug for the field so to all the young students out there who are listening Mm -hmm. um don't just you know without thinking about it jump into the web it space i think that the future uh and a lot of the most interesting exciting things and the ability to have a positive impact on humanity are going to be in the biosciences That's wonderful. It's a great plug, and I will fully concur on that. (laughs) Yes. I would love to see, you know, our engineering and and business and um, computer science students really take a hard look at how they can contribute to this field. Yep. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you. All right. There's no roadmap to follow when it comes to understanding biological systems. We'll continue to explore the financial, legal, and ethical implications of this burgeoning field. Thanks to Robbie Barbero for talking with me today. Until next time, this is Christina Elson in the Ink Tank. You can subscribe to the Ink Tank on Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. Visit theinktank.org for a full transcript of this episode. A special thank you to the Kauffman Foundation for their support. From the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland, thank you for joining us in the Ink Tank.